Hello, puppies and kittens. Some of you uh, more astute observers might have noticed that the theme song is a little different than it usually is. Quick explanation of that. Uh, 15 or 20 years ago, I went to this website that was offering absolutely free, royalty-free, free download, use it in your videos for free website. And I downloaded two or three songs that I use for different projects. And one of them I quite liked, and that's the one that we usually play. And I, uh, I used that one because it was advertised as absolutely free, whatever. Then the website I got it from changed both the song a bit. They, they did like a different edit of it. Uh, and the original version was um, no longer for free. It was that now they're charging for it. And so I got a copyright block and I, I contested it. And, uh, and, and for whatever reason, the, just, the decision came back as, oh, never mind, fine, you, you got it when it, was, when it was offered for free and royalty free and all like that. So have at it, continue on. A full decade later, a different person, a parent, different entity now owns that song and has hit a whole bunch of my playlists with copyright blocks over that tune. A whole bunch. So... I've got uh, my, my email this morning was demonetized, 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 copyrighted content found, blah, 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 blah. blah. So, fuck them. <laughs> yeah, that is that insane. You are that the only reason anyone knows decade. that song. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I was not expecting that. Time. After a decade, I wasn't expecting that. I think it's time you and I made our metal band and we made our own yes. music yes brillo tampon would be <laughs> 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 haven't we suffered enough <laughs> we'll use my uh, old band name h2 mm. oddities you 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 heard the name Brillo Tampon and still opted for anything else. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> although that was a, that was actually uh, the actual name of my high school band, H Two Oddities. <laughs> oh, I have blackmail on an old friend with a CD they made in high school. I wonder if I should use that sometime. Okay. Well, anyway. Yeah, we what? won't go there. Who shall God be smiting today? Well, not really smiting. It's uh, a poem. It's Deborah's song. Yeah, so it's essentially, you know, like, hey, good job smiting before. <laughs> Thanks, God. Yeah. <laughs> right. He does prefer to have the cheerleading section. I I, yeah. I always forget. Yeah. Although this, uh, so this section does, in, in theme, in style, it shares a lot of similarities to the Song of the Sea, uh, and even kind of how it was included into the text. So, like most scholars think that you know this is this is pretty old. Uh, you know, it's one very, of the oldest. Yeah, definitely one of the oldest, and it you know may may have been. Uh, I mean, it it had different stages of development, but the core oh. of it is uh, is one of the oldest pieces of literature in the uh in the bible it might even be the oldest potentially so i, I uh, wish we had dr kip here to do his translation of it because i love <laughs> how he preserves the polytheism instead of uh, you know uh, by the way that reminds me um lawrence did, did we ever do uh the, the the biblical cosmology episode yet did no we, we didn't one? uh that is something yeah it's a yeah there's a like we could totally do that. I have the research more or less done for it, uh, but yeah, I still have to like you know write the script and uh, come to a. F I I okay. So here's the conclusion that I came to so far. Mm -hmm. The because uh, what would need to be done is a bigger diachronic study by people who are way smarter than me, uh, especially in like uh, terms of Mesopotamian mythology. Uh, because all the the meta studies on these things they don't give you enough like specific timeline progression and like and place progression uh for for these mythologies but the the conclusion that i came to is okay so biblical authors believe that the earth was flat like that's like nearly 100 i'm very confident of that but what i'm not confident on is if 
uh, a physical dome. They believed in a physical sky. That was physical for them. But was it a dome shape is my biggest question. If it's and going over a disc, it kind of has to be. It right? doesn't. Especially when they describe that the sun and the moon are on tracks across the firmament mm -hmm. and the birds fly within the expanse of the firmament. That's that's they, talking they, about. They fly up against it. So in in some, uh, I mean, this is a bigger topic, right? In in some uh, of the Mesopotamian and the you know Syrian texts, Babylonian texts, they uh, describe the Earth and all of its different like uh, layers being in uh, being connected by like ropes. So you could picture it as like having like one plate and it's uh, it's like hanging on another plate by ropes. It's like uh, a theater. It's like a theater with the the props hanging down, and you pull one uh, over, and you, yeah. I'm not I'm not tent. sure what it's uh, what it's like entirely a uh, called or what a great uh, analogy for it is, but uh, there like that is a view that's in there, and it it's hard to say which one of many views uh, they held, which is why a better diachronic study would be needed. I, I do have to say, as far as crystalline domes, that idea continued uh, far later into the classics era, where you talk about the, uh, you know, the trepidation of the spheres being actually the movement of the, well, the planets around the Earth, including the sun and moon, on spheres, which kept them on their tracks, possibly pushed by angels, maybe just by the mystical power of God. Um so that's not as old an idea, although I, I am assuming it's built on something pre-existing. Well, I would, I would like to do this. I would like to involve yep. at least, at least Dr. Kep, if we can't get Josh in, not in on it too, because I had somebody challenge me that there you know, says nowhere in the Bible does it say the earth is flat. I'm like, well, every, everywhere in the Bible is consistent with the flat disc shaped earth where the, the, wor the world is like a map divided into four quadrants, north, south, east, west, mounted up on columns that it has this dome over it, which is described as solid and then and looking like mirrored glass or molten glass. And it's mm. and it's somehow like it's hammered out or whatever. Yeah. And then it's got windows in it to let the rain in and all that. And then right. the sun and the moon and the stars are all contained within the expanse and the birds fly in the expanse and all of this. So, yeah, that's that's what they describe. Yeah, it's a uh, it uh, for, for, for me, the one last piece that I'm kind of looking for is that like the dome shape because i can conceive of cosmologies that would be like you know a whole bunch of planes right like kind of stacked on top of one another uh like i can conceive of something like that indicated and, in the text uh well the thing is it would be more technically indicated in the mesopotamian texts uh but there have there are some pieces of evidence that would sh uh, show that the Mesopotamians believed in like a dome at some point, but it's not entirely clear, which is why I'm like continuously looking for more pieces of evidence. Okay. But what I can fair. say is definitely uh, whatever the firmament was, whatever shape it was, they definitely believed it was solid. It was solid firmament, and they definitely believe that the Earth is flat. It was the it was the forbidden shape of the dodecahedron. Uh, of course. <laughs> Don't be silly. It was obviously Metatron's cube. The D twenty. I'm gonna read a couple of comments before we get started. Dara O'Kane says, "What do you think of ancient aliens Christianity? They believe in Elohim are a race of aliens." I think that's uh, dumb from uh, multiple fields. Uh, <laughs> Not, that not, sounds not. like some spirit science shit. It sounds like, like yeah. I an alien Batchman to pull that, that shit out. Too stupid to consider. Yeah. Yes, I would uh, have to get a really crazy perm and then go aliens. <laughs> <laughs> you would also have to do all the drugs, like <laughs> 1980s Stephen King levels of drugs. Arnis, okay. it's even, too bad. Arnis, cheap ones. And it's too bad that the guy dropped off of social media, but I had a guest on my show who said that the, um, the, the Elohim had, had copulated with uh, lizards and that's how we got dinosaurs and he was going to get evidence and get back. But yeah, 
Never happened. Yeah, but of course. <laughs> yeah, I want to share something. This is the last can of this that I got. Ah! Black, Black Sacrament Ooh. Imperial Stout. I got to get me some of that. I'm not even Unfortunately, the brewery went out of business. We <gasps> went to the brewery oh. and they were permanently closed. Okay, we need to start more openly blasphemous atheist businesses. Yeah, I if mean, you brew beer, reach out to me because I want an imperial stout in double digit ABV, something we can call godless heathen that has, you know, like ancho chilies and a number of other things in it. If you if you're one of those like crazy beer beer people, I need cases and cases of this for the next for the next American Atheist National Convention. Yes. I'm yes. I'm driving. I'm driving to the next American Atheist National Convention and I want to carry cases and cases of that shit with me. Okay. I want it I want it to be slightly sweet and I want it to be I want it to, to taste good on pancakes. Mm. And it should be thick enough that when you pour it out of, out of the bottle or the can and preferably the bottle, it should look like you're draining the crankcase of a 65 Chevy. <laughs> You know, if you want to put it on pancakes, you probably have to boil it down with some maple syrup. But that's just I, my I, I take it back. Waffles. <laughs> I want a beer that would go good on waffles. <laughs> okay, so Matt White says, Aaron, given that pastors have said Autism Awareness Week is demonic and I am autistic, does that give me automatic membership into the Satanic Temple? <laughs> Nope, you're well, gonna have you, you. You have to meet the main criteria, the one absolute criteria, and that's the twenty five dollar membership fee. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good to know that I worship Satan as well. Hail Satan! Well, well, they, uh, here's a funny we thing: already that. if you worship Satan, then you can't you can't uh, join the Satanic Temple. They're entirely atheist, and so yeah. is. Uh, so is Anton Lavey's Church of Satan. They're both uh, wholly atheist organizations who promote science over superstition both of them and always it doesn't have doesn't mean i can't do rituals to piss off my inner traumatized ex-christian oh hell i've done rituals that rituals can be fun yeah i tried to summon a demon once and it didn't work i showed up as soon as i could <laughs> <laughs> i don't think he's that high okay. level yet <laughs> so then we have martin Sure. Hue Holm. Hue Holm. How, how do you know this? Because there is another commentator named Huebri, which I, <laughs> I have in my notes. So I know. In in my commentary on the judges, there is one commentator named Huebri, which has SJ uh, with umlaut. So I know it's Hue uh, Something like that. I think it depends if it's Swedish or Norwegian. It's Swedish. I mean, Norwegian is more like think, true. It, look, look at the currency. Yeah. It's Swedish krona. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be a clue. Yeah. Yep. So, Tomer is so Tomer is is frequently way more on the ball than I give him <laughs> credit for. I am I am often surprised. Thank you. Okay. Well, and and by I I mean more on the ball than I am, and more than I thought he would be. So <laughs> both ways. So anyway, he offers a one twenty one hundred and twenty nine Swedish kroner, and says uh, I have finally caught up. It took time, effort, and a lot of time. I'm actually seeing my heroes live, watching your ugly faces. <laughs> Sadly, not Tomer. In all their glory on my big ass TV, starstruck love. Somebody asked me today, why does my wife have a boxer whose eyes do the Marty Feldman thing? Uh -huh. uh, and, and why does she have this bold, one eyed bulldog who looks so hideous? And why does she have this bull mastiff that has this huge fucking Joker grin? You wouldn't believe how hideous these dogs are. And she thinks they're cute. They asked me, why, do, why does my wife keep those? And I remember what, when I took a picture of my Jeep, because I thought it was just, I thought it was hideous. I thought it was driving the, the, the automotive version of Darth Vader. I took a picture of my Jeep and I said, you know what? My Jeep is not pretty. It's just ugly in just the right way. And my wife says, that's exactly how I feel about you. Oh, <laughs> see, I was just going to be offended on my own behalf. Excuse me, sir. For some reason I saw that oh, coming. I am gorgeous and you know it. All right, so the finally, next comment is... Oh, someone finally acknowledges how ugly my face is. Thank you. That's the one honest person <laughs> that's been here. Oh, right. You have the trauma, too. We have to insult you or you think you were lying. I feel sorry for Isaac. He knows better. He does. 
wait, I'm not ugly. I've been left out. <laughs> it's true. He's not ugly. All right, and then Eric Wander says, uh, "Is the song of Deborah inspired in the song of inspired in the song of Moses? Both texts are super old. So which one is the earliest?" Some scholars say the song of Deborah is from the 12th century BCE. Well, some say that Moses is from the 12th century BCE, too. Yeah. And some say that Moses is from the 15th century BCE as well. Yeah. And is some it... say no, that Moses scholars. is from Atlantis. And some say lizard people are from the Sirius <laughs> star system. No, 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 no. The lizard people true. are the Martians. The Jews are a different race of extraterrestrials. Mm. Keep up on your patch man. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. As and then, <laughs> when it comes to inspiration, which direction? Uh, I mean, they they might have just been written in a similar kind of context, but uh, I think uh, it was Mays who made a pretty good argument that uh, I mean, it doesn't change it too much, right? He argued that it was from the 11th century instead of the 12th, but either way, uh, it's not a huge huge difference there. Uh, for at least for the Song of Deborah. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the influence in the Song of Moses, I know we're going to be talking about a lot of uh, about a lot of parallels between them. Yeah. So it's going to be something we get to. I'm really intrigued, and I, I wish we had remembered to bring uh, a Dr. Kidd's translation of the Moses at least, uh, because it's just yeah, it's very intriguing. We've discussed how this is uh, Deuteronomistic history. The bulk of this would have been written down in this format during the time of Josiah and the priests of the Yahwist that, you know, started the henotheistic cult, not started, pushed the henotheistic Yahwist cult into political prominence at that time and went around murdering everyone who blasphemed by worshiping anyone else. Um, so, but this is definitely, um, you know, in that they're not composing it all at that time. It's not, you know, Stephen King writing it. It's all, you know, you've got some existing um, stories, some existing historical figures that you're maybe talking up the way Shakespeare did with, uh, uh, if you read, say, Macbeth. The, the, the historical characters are actually those, the spin put on them is pretty heavily unhistorical. Um, if you want to talk about, you know, who was the good guy and who was the bad guy in reality similar sorts of things but then yeah you've got these things and songs are able to survive somehow for so much longer um and it, yeah it's it's i i just find it amazing that you can have these hymns and the core of them although you know maybe they sort of polished in a bit here and there being part of this far older tradition that when it started would have been so vastly different from the religion as it was at the time this was written down. And then also vastly different from what it is now. And then the next comment is from Sable Eagle, who says, I think you could turn rig welter into waffle syrup, w waffle syrup, but you'd have to distill out the nasties below 78 degrees C, distill out the ethanol at 78 degrees C, distill out on other nasties and boil off water. I don't, I don't know what rig welter is. It's a kind of beer, I guess. Okay. And then Tsunami says, Lawrence, you're only pretty when you're milking the bits of the father. Milking the, the tits, tits of the, the father. Of the father. <laughs> Damn straight. Damn straight. She knows. <laughs> oh, God's tits is such an iconic meme for you to have brought into this world. Hey, it's I'm so pretty, proud of pretty you. solid. First of all, all, all praise be to the odes of Solomon. <laughs> they they kind of they spelled it out for us. Oh, what was that? The Chodes of Solomon? <laughs> the Chodes of Solomon. Good. <laughs> solid. I'm sure you had many of those, too. Oh, yeah. Did yeah, I just that's... hear the Chode of Solomon? Yeah. Thank guys. Oh. Y'all are disgusting. <laughs> okay. Trevor Wright says, I would like Lawrence to know that your interest in Mesopotamia, in my opinion, makes you smarter than the average person who could care less to study this subject. Well, here's the thing. There is uh, a necessity to studying 
not like if so if someone's going in to like study the bible in any serious way they need to study the world around it because these texts were not written in a vacuum there is a very good quote uh from a uh i, I don't even know was he a, a french linguist or something like that um and i can't even pronounce his his last name it's like a uh uh, uh, uh riff uh i don't know how to pronounce it um but uh he I pulled up this quote here. He makes a very good point. Uh, so it explains above all that the most important component of the literary work of art, and indeed the key to the interpretation of its significance, should be found outside the work, beyond its margins in the intertext. So you look at the surrounding culture and the surrounding works of art, uh, that including literature, to kind of get the full meaning of a certain text. Because without all that, you just don't have the context and you just can't do it right. Yeah, and I, I, I would have to, to back that up. One of the things that really disturbs me about culturally about teaching this kind of subject is well, how, necessi how, how necessary it is because, I mean, there are so many people just in Texas, a, a, a scary number of people who think that the oldest book ever written is Genesis. Yeah, they should uh, read more. <laughs> You're assuming they can read the Bible even. They True. they read the daily bread excerpts with the thing that tells them what to think about that. Uh, but maybe they have a slightly more judgmental version for Texas. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to read the Bible. My preacher reads me the parts that he wants me to know about. Yeah, they, oh, yeah. they don't read the list. They go to church for the book report. Now, yeah. now that you, me <laughs> now no, that you mention it, do read the Bible. They just don't read it through, and they read it with like predetermined blinders on. Yeah, and I want to I want to apologize to everybody for doing a, an odd day and an odd hour for this show, especially to uh, Mark, who probably isn't going to be able to join us until the top of the hour. Issues came up that had to be. You know, I had to reschedule, reschedule again, reschedule again. It was just it was just awkward. Other. Uh, it, it, it becomes awkward when outside influences change my schedule in ways that I don't, I can't readily work with, but you know, I'm, I'm sure people have dealt with that before. Thank you for the people that are here who were able to accommodate. And anyway, who's reading today? I, I suggest Lilith because it fits. I, I have been nominated. <laughs> okay. Read like 213. This. Of course. The Song of Deborah. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. When the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I will sing to the Lord. I will sing. I will make music to Yahweh, the God of Israel. O oh Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before Yahweh, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the roads were abandoned, travelers took to winding paths, Village life in Israel ceased, ceased until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. When they chose new gods, war came to the city gates, and not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. You who ride on white donkeys, sitting on your saddle blankets, and you who walk along the road, consider the voice of the singers at the watering places. They recite the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts of his warriors in Israel. Then the people of the Lord went down to the city gates. Wake up, wake up, Deborah, wake up, wake up, break out in song. Arise, O Barak. Take captive your captives, O son of Abinoam. Then the men who were left came down to the nobles, and the people of the Lord came to me with the mighty. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, we already have some similarities and also some differences mm -hmm. uh, with uh, with the song of uh, with the song of Moses. So the one thing that should be noted is there are of course like the similarities, like how it uh, how it I think it's uh, man. How does it start there? To okay, so yeah, so in uh, it does share some it, in liturgical usage i guess uh if we compare in in exodus 15 uh it has a this, this is a quote from uh from brettler here uh yeah so similar to exodus uh, 15 1 which many consider to be liturgical and to various extents particularly in psalms in psalms uh which ask yahweh to listen yet even though judges 5 share certain elements with various liturgies, it's difficult to characterize it in its entirety as a liturgy. The role of Yahweh is not significant enough. Note, for example, how sharply the opening of Judges 5 contrasts in this regard with Exodus 15, which opens in such a clear theocentric fashion. I will sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. Uh, and there, I mean, there are still more that we're going to go through throughout this whole thing, but you still have this uh, this whole bless Yahweh thing. So it's, uh, I mean, that could just as easily just be like, here's a, co a common stock phrase, right? Mm -hmm. But specifically for liturgical things. But as... Yeah, those, the yeah, Selah as, kind of a dive. Yeah, okay. kind of like that. Uh, so, although I, yeah, I think for the Selah, isn't that supposed to be like, oh, well, we need to add like, you know, part of a meter or something, right? I, I've heard various interpretations, both musical and liturgical. Um, and sometimes people just chanting it in the middle because they don't know what to do. Uh, but that kind of call and response effect is is definitely part of these songs of rejoicing. And, and part of, I mean, that's the worship songs of the 20s. You know, you'd have the sort of the chorus everybody could kind of call and repeat that part even if they couldn't figure out all the you know verses in the revival tent so yeah absolutely but yeah so that? even the uh i believe is this meant to be the uh the core section that we just read over two through uh, that's introduction that's an introduction i would say this is an introduction to like the the battle i would say no no i know but i mean like the core section as in like historically like the old um, there there is part of it that might be a later con uh, inclusion right i think so but there is uh like in this would be like the oldest the oldest section yeah i think the roots in amalek Especially is one of the verse four is very old probably verse four yeah when you went out from seir when you marched from yeah. the land of yeah, like that, yeah the uh now i am arisen a mother in israel phrase for deborah is um it's, it's one of those phrases that ends up in a lot of literature and things like Pilgrim's Progress. You'll see it there. Um, but I noticed that God is also, Yahweh is encroaching on somewhat on the providences of other gods. It was, you know, the earth shaking is him, but Baal is supposed to initially give the waters of the rain, at least for crop. I'm not sure if there's a different God who is in charge of making it stormy for battles because you can never have good weather for a war. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, eh, you can see that kind of, oh, I don't want to say liturgical language. What's the word I'm searching for? Oh, it escapes me. Mm -hmm. I clearly need more coffee. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote a lot of comments on this because, uh, I felt like it needed because, yeah. There's so much things to talk about. So I'll start on verse one. Deborah and Barak sang this song. The Masoretic text has the verb sang in the feminine singular, tashal, and literally reads, and she sang Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, compare KJV. This reading led traditional commentators like Kimchi, Gersonides, and Abravanel to conclude that Deborah wrote the song and Barak only joined her in singing. The use of a singular verb that precedes multiple subjects is common in the Bible, as in Genesis 33, 7, Numbers 12, 1, and Amos 8, 13. Some Septuagint manuscripts and the Vulgate read in the third plural. On verse 2, when the princes in Israel take the lead. In Hebrew, it's before 
פרעות בישראל. The clause in Hebrew is difficult, as Fernandez Marcos explains. The meaning of פרה is uncertain. Several possibilities have been considered, but the first of the following two is to be preferred. A, deriving the verb from the Arabic פרעה, to excel, the idea of nobles or leaders makes good sense. פרעות is plural of the max- masculine noun from the same root, which e- equals to in that the leaders took the lead, supported by most of the Greek tradition, like the vo- and Vitus Latina and other secondary versions. And the second, B, the phrase could refer to the unloosing of one's hair, compare numbers 5, 18 and 6, 5, as, indicate, as indicating consecration for war, because hair represents strength. In this case, the two words would come from a homonym roots, para, to loose or let free, and pera, loosely hanging hair. This is probably the intended meaning of the Vaticanus, quote, an unveiling was unveiled, more comparable to in Symmachus as, um, I didn't translate it, I think I asked Lawrence, uh, which is a bit awkward. Um, I posted for Lawrence to read. So, I'm... So in the, uh, wait, did I already do this translation? I, I like think I you did this, and I forgot to include this in my commentary because I'm so <laughs> lazy. Um, <laughs> that's, that's fair. I'll I'll pull it up because I, I I let's see, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the, that word means off the top of my head, so I have to go back and check. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up. Come back. I'll come back to my commentary. Um, and more in accord with the verbal form and recorded besides by the Lucianic manuscript 54. Vulgate is paraphrastic, paraphrastic, O U of Israel. Tagum has unloose, followed by a large Midrashic expansion, and Peshitta probably assumes the Aramaic use of unloosing in the sense of payment of a debt for the vengeance which, with which Israel was rewarded. End quote. Traditional commentators varied. Rashi read, When breaches befell Israel, Kara, when Israel deviated from their way. Kimchi and Abafanel read when there were the takings of revenge of vengeance, and modern commentators generally follow Vaticanus and read when hair hangs loose in Israel. Now on verse three about the kings, I just uh, took a quote from uh, Origen. I mean, Origen writes that the kings to which Deborah directs her song are understood to be believers who have Christ reigning in them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I just, I'm going to giggle at Origins. Oh, bless his heart. Bless his heart. And I mean that in the oh, holy so is Christ, way. Is Christ the, the weather god? He's raining. Christ is everything. <laughs> He's nah. just covering you with his seed from the sky. You. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we know we've come to the end of that video. <laughs> <laughs> I got another oh. comment. <laughs> Bryce uh, Barnett says, Lawrence, can you make a complete list of everything that's true in the Bible? Yeah, that ought to fit on the napkin. I feel <laughs> there, there is a video that's called uh, like uh, the real, the historical people in the Bible, something like that. Um but the uh, useful charts to the video. I want to say they go through like I think it's twelve characters are attested in in like archaeology, and they're all you know very very late. Um, Even like, David, I don't feel like David is attested no. so much as the line of David is attested. Which yeah, yeah. well, I mean he he mentions that in the ancient yeah. world, like that's something. Like we have so few sources for for this stuff in general that like mm. we'll, we'll take what we can get. Um, but the like just as a piece of evidence for something uh mm-hmm. but either yeah. way by like the was it ninth century i think uh that the moabite steel or was it the eighth century i forget um but the or the, the uh, mesh of steel uh talking about the line of david already kind of showing oh by this time there was already some importance on this figure david uh so i'd be fine with mm. him being some more lord whatever um yeah, I, so a lot of the historical stuff that you're going to get is predominantly found in uh first and it's in first and second samuel and first and second kings that's mm-hmm. where like the history really starts uh you can yeah. also like corroborate some of it with like the version in chronicles except 
even then that's more of like a, a theological outlook on the same things uh <clears throat> there's stuff there's stuff that you can corroborate in some of the prophets at least not, not about like what's going to happen in the future necessarily <laughs> um you can't really take it that way it's it's, it's ex eventu prophecy so it was written after the fact but oh yeah like we and can... somehow it's still wrong sometimes that's that's that, that just too, embarrassing yeah. yeah the 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 best one is probably the um what was it in isaiah it was the uh was it about tyre the yeah, prophecy of tyre i think um, oh yeah yeah so the thing is like they had prophesied a, a war that would last like was it 70 years or something like that um or like 65 years but the actual war lasted 12 years. Uh, so mm. issue there. Um, but either way. It was probably written during it, maybe. Maybe during it, yeah. Um, so the... But yeah, there, there are there are things we can corroborate. And that's not necessarily... That wouldn't like necessarily say like the story is true. There are just pieces of the story, which would be true. Like we can show... Like, for example, in Hosea, there's a lot of talk about like, oh, you know, why are you guys worshiping these uh, these bulls or whatever, or these calf statues, however it is, right? However, it's a uh, but I forget. But uh, while <clears throat> like what we can in fact show is that there were some uh, early Israelites that were worshiping Yahweh as a bull. That is something we can demonstrate. Uh, our or El, could both, have been El Elyon. Either well, it, in in the text, I, identified as Yahweh, but no, uh, no, yeah, it's not, not not El Elia, it's El Toro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but either way, like we can corroborate something. That, that we have to remember really well. that uh, the way that myth and history are written now is not the same way as it was understood before. Like <laughs> myth and history were like connected, so they would include history in their myth and vice versa. So it's our jobs as historians to be able to parse that out. You know, what so that would be like if we went to uh, if we're studying history in school and they tell us about George Washington chopping down the cherry tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's bullshit. Like, that. like, obviously, there was a George Washington. There's plenty of stuff for that. Um, but oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, I think. Um, yeah, just to uh, look this up. Yeah. So for for what you just uh uh, the Greek that you sent over, Tomer. Yeah, you um, we translated it, when heads uncover themselves in Israel. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's because... back in 29, <laughs> February 29. Right, Do they yeah. mean metaphorical heads like leaders, like princes, as it says there? I mean, it could be a case of, you yeah, know, yeah. the men who should be taking action and leadership stepping forward or not stepping forward, and that's why a woman has to take charge. It, there's always a vibe mm. undercurrent of that in, uh, I know, in, in my you know, evangelical studies of the, that text originally. Um, kind that of is women a, have to that do is the work. Yeah, it's, I, I was going to say for this, the history thing, I actually, like upon thinking about it a little longer, I think the Macbeth analogy is really, really good because there was actually a Macbeth, a Scottish king who came after a Duncan, who they think he murdered or killed possibly in a way that wouldn't have been considered murder with the rights of kings and, you know, a very ancient, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, that that he fought, you know, with the trees and the, the lay on Macduff and damned be he, the first cries hold enough is in any way historically accurate. So it's, <laughs> the, the characters have some basis in reality. The, uh, the, the full play is, is, uh, is, you know, no, <laughs> I never read the finish of the question. Uh, the, the rest of the question was, I feel like that'd be a much easy that'd be much easier than listing what's false. Mm -hmm. I'd imagine it'd be less than a page of truth. Uh, depends on the font size. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, in in either case, uh, I mean, you can find like things that like maybe not are fully true, but like, you know, half truths, you could find like a hint at a truth, right? Mm. Like something that's just like referenced and not like explicitly told about something like that. And how easy does it have to be? Is it that they in fact did uh, eat lamb and drink wine and eat bread? Right. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure that's all true. <gasps> yeah. Well, that, yeah. Yeah. You could, I would say yeah. the one of the most interesting uh, 
pieces of historical uh, artifacts that like corroborate like something really minor in the Bible is there's this tiny little uh, clay, um, what they call tablet from Assyria. And it says, it mentions some guy borrowing something or whatever, where it's like a receipt. And it's this, this name is in the Bible, but it's like a minor character. It's like the, like the assistant general or something. Um, so he's only like mentioned once, but it's corroborated and it's just like this really minor thing. What I love is when, when Christians come up to me, they, they tell me that they found Sodom and Gomorrah <laughs> or they found either one. Right. So archaeologists are, are, have found what they declare to be, you know, mm-hmm. Sodom or whatever. And so they say that 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 completely proves the Bible. Oh, OK. Did you know that archaeologists actually did find Troy? Do you think that proves Zeus? No, yeah. well, yeah. it definitely proves Athena, Poseidon and a list. Uh, the you know the sirens that because you've got the whole odyssey thing and uh yeah yeah look at that but yeah finding uh historic was uh was pretty cool which is which was the the, the name of the place and uh here's I, i'm at a loss because i know that tomer knows how to pronounce this name <laughs> and it would appear that tomer also knows how to how to how to pronounce the next thing which is all greek to me <laughs> no, I that that's something I posted for Lawrence to read. Yeah. Okay, so Martin Sjoholm. Hueholm. Sjoholm? What? Hueholm. Hueholm. Hueholm? Hueholm. So, so I think the, the closest. The is easiest. Not a I think the easiest. Just say Martin. With, just say I think Martin. The easiest way is just Sjoholm with a sh sound. I think it's easiest. And it's yeah. not that Wrong. close, but it's close enough. If you, if okay. you say well, Martin this, from Sweden, Arn, it's, it's easier. Let's focus on the comment, please. Sweden, <laughs> Swedish shouldn't be that different from Norwegian, right? I mean, in Norwegian, the O with the U. He wants a t-shirt. Sound, <laughs> Just right. to remind you, we're still on verse four. It's all your fault. Offers <laughs> 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 oh, twenty-seven Arn. Swedish kroner. It says merch. I want the t-shirt. And then Lawrence, you're gonna have to read this one. No, no, no. That's something I posted. I only told. No, the, the, uh, we, we, we already covered this one. Where yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Simitish so they're telling dirty jokes in the chat in Greek. Yep, that's exactly what's happening. Let's get to the interesting uh, verse now. Yeah, now on verse okay. four. Verse when five. Four. No, verse four is pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Now on verse four, when you Lord went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom. Smith and Blocksmith note that the place name of a dome is associated with the Shasu. They note that one Egyptian list tells of the land of Shasu, Yaho, with Yaho often being thought to be a reference to a place named after Yahweh. They write that if the reference to Yahweh in Egyptian sources is correct, then this god may have originated in the region of Seir and Edom, and not Israel. They further write, According to Christoph Levine, the southern mountain tradition for Edom is a post-exilic development based on references to Edom in Isaiah 63.1 and Judges 5.4, as well as the use of Nazalu in Isaiah 63.19 and Judges 5.5.8. As so, counter-arguments... Go ahead. Can I please continue? Thank you. Wait. As counter-arguments, the clause in which Nazalu appears... Uh, Sorry, the clause in which Nazalu appears in Judges 5.5a appears to be an inner expansion in its context, and so perhaps the verb derived from Isaiah 63.19. In addition, the southern location of the god in Isaiah 63 goes back to a tradition at least as old as the late 9th to early mid-8th century. Kuntilat Ajud inscriptions, with their mentions of Yahweh of Teman, as well as the inscription of Divine Theophany. These witnesses suggest a tradition of theophany in the south, and more specifically, Negev Sinai, that goes back at least to the late 8th century based on the epigraphic evidence, or the mid-8th century according to the archaeological remains. Moreover, the descriptions of the theophany differ su- sufficiently in Isaiah 63 and the brief poetic passages to suggest that, if there is some particular literary rela- relationship, Isaiah 63 represents an elaboration inspired in part by the old poetic theme of Judges 5. Favoring the tradition's antiquity in Judges 5 verses 45 overall are the geographical names and their variations. Given the parallelism 
of the southern places in old poetry, quote unquote, the names Edom and Seir point to what Cross calls ancient oral variants, which fit less well with a theory of scribal copying. More notably, the modes of the theophanies in Judges 5 verses 45 and Isaiah 63 also differ significantly. Rain marks the first, like Baal's mar martial theophanies, while bloody warfare characterizes the second, like Anat's warfare. Okay, I got a question about it. What is this this word that you're saying, Yaho? Yaho. Uh, God's Yaho? name, Yo. Yahweh. Uh, it's off it's to work we go. Yeah, no, it's it's more like uh, think of it as spelled more like Yahoo. Well, actually, the the the, the exact spelling is Y H W with three. Three like that. three is uh, it's often used for uh, at least in yeah. transliteration. Uh, it's used for a sound that's actually very hard to make. Um, uh, and yeah. I, I I remember coming across this in like Arabic transliterations. Um, mm. so I'm not sure it's oh, like is the it IN. an IPA symbol. I I don't even remember. I just remember it being a bitch to pronounce. Not, and it's because I think I, it, the the reason it looks like that is because the letter itself looks kind of like a three. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a it's a I think it's a it's like Egyptian Arabic written in English letters on for the internet. They started yeah. using three for IN. Seven is like the ch sound, I think. And then I think they have another one, but I can't remember what it was. I would have got uh, my IPA book. But it's not uh, IPA. No, I know. It's just because it looks like the Arabic letter itself. If you look at the Arabic letter, I am, it kind of is. But either way, the the that's actually one of the funniest moments. And I, you know, Dan Barker lost his faith watching the, the um, Nova documentary on Finkelstein's work, the... Uh, Bible's Buried Secrets, and that was one of the funniest moments for me, was that the Jews not only stole the land, but potentially also the gods of the southern tribes, and that at least one variant of the original name was Yahoo. And I, <laughs> like... Yeah, they're, they're, they're a lot of... They're, they're, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, Aaron. Yahoo is one of the names. Uh, there has also just been, you know, uh, Yah found by itself as well. Uh, there are a lot of different variations on the on the same name and you hear yah by itself most often in minnesota incredible <laughs> put that in the commentary oh i thought that was just oh <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> okay so then martin swahom swaholm said uh, uh, he offers 65 swedish kroner and says isaac pronounced my name like 100 <laughs> percent Shovel. Isaac, say it again. Shovel. Like a strong. All right. I think maybe, that, maybe I it's even like a, a dial is a different. Yeah, dial it might be dialect. Like, I think remember, like Swedish and Norwegian, they're very similar. And if you live near the border, you might speak more of the country next to you than you know the city in your own country. So okay. it's like a what's it called? Like it, we, we you mentioned it in biology, like a. No transition, a uh, um, you know, it's a gradient, yeah, it's a gradient, but this is like a, 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 it's a, it's a different word you're thinking of that means roughly the same thing, yeah. A language, I was, I was watching my, my three year old daughter, excuse me, three year old granddaughter reading from flashcards today, and she comes up with SO, she goes, So, you know, and my daughter goes, Yeah, that's very good, and then she pulls up another flashcard, it's DO, she goes, DO, and my. <laughs> 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 oh english makes no sense it is yes such a bastard language. it's fun though yeah okay do continue tomer yes oh okay. continuum is probably just the way that it's a, a, a language continuum or a dialect continuum i think it's probably the continuation, word continuation continue yeah okay yeah. i know the one you mean yeah now on verse five the one of sinai in hebrew ze sinai this phrase also appears in Psalms 68, 9. Commentators have long debated about the meaning of this phrase. Kimchi writes, Just as Sinai trembled before the God of Israel, so too did the whole world tremble from before him. Butler notes that Moore, Bernie, and Helzberg thought that this was a misplaced gloss on the mountains. Albright and Cross wrote that Ze, this one, represents an archaic pronoun du, which creates a divine epithet, the one of Sinai. This suggestion is followed by Bowling, Gray, and Sojin. 
Lindas concluded that the name is, quote, a chance survival of an obsolete title, perhaps that of a god worshipped by proto-Israelite groups mentioned with the Shasu in Egyptian texts before the arrival of the Moses group in Palestine, end quote. While Butler and Nelson agree with Lindas and see it as an archaic title of Yahweh, Nidich views it as a gloss, as seen by its omission from Vitus Latina. Amit writes that the mention of Sinai hints at the revelation at Mount Sinai, Exodus 19.18, although Sasson disagrees. Of course he does, silly man. On verse 6, in the days of Yael, the mention of Yael has led Rashi, or an addition to Rashi, to conclude that she was a judge. Sasson notes that Moore suggested removing her name because she wasn't a judge. He also notes that others tried to amend her name into Yavin, like Albright, or Yael by Lindas. Butler notes Ald's suggestion to read In the Days of the Yoke, but without sufficient support. Because we can't have a woman in charge. That's just icky. <laughs> now, on verse 7, villagers, in Hebrew it's perazon. The exact meaning of the word is unclear. Peshitta and Tagum, followed by traditional commentators, and Nidich read unwalled cities or villages. Vaticanus and Vitus Latina have the powerful ones. Fernandez Marcos writes that some proposed reading Perazon as leaders, like Sojin, warriors by Albright and Bowling, or champions by Driver, based on the Arabic Faraza. He writes, however, that these proposals have been shown by Steger, or Stager to be misleading and unnecessary and suggested reading Free Men Villagers. Other suggestions include Peasantry by Butler and Nelson, Village Militia by Smith and Blacksmith, and Hamlets by Sasson. I, now, actually, that's interesting because um, thinking back to that documentary, and I don't know how accurate this is considered now, Lawrence, if you just think about it, but there was at least uh, the idea put forth that some of the, the sort of the early Israelite encampments were actually slaves, not in Egypt, but and not as a race, but sort of became a race having escaped from enslavement in that large city state, at least a portion of their history. This is, it's all more complicated, obviously, but there was this one um, sort of failing city that fell to rebellion from within, from the, you know, the slaves and the poor uh, that you know lived in the lower class areas, and that their earlier settlements were noted as being very egalitarian. Nobody had, you know, a dramatically better house than everybody else, or dramatically better. Um, you know, not that there was no variation, but it seemed like at least for a little while there, they were trying to do something far more egalitarian, possibly only amongst men. But I mean, in uh, what would it be called in a class sense? Mm. Uh, certainly more egalitarian for for a little while, but uh, of course, you still have cultural issues that are you know there's still yeah. still plenty of uh plenty of social. And uh, it didn't know. last. You ended up with kings and warlords, but like pro the whole thing about judges is that it was before the kings. Well, so I mean, there might be some reflection of that time in it. Uh, there, yeah, there, there, there might be, but like the thing is, you still have even in, uh, you know, for evidence in Israel at least, there is still uh, a good amount of kings rising up in the mm -hmm. in the first millennium, like the early first millennium. Uh, so it. I mean, it depends on what time you're talking about, right? But if they were, you know, slaves or not, yeah, some of them would be slaves at some point, sure. Uh, very often to each other. Uh, but there is, but yeah, when it comes to the whole, like, you can't say like the whole group of people were enslaved to such and such place. No, it was more like a group formed out of the slaves and impoverished that had rebelled from the city state that then may have formed some of the basis that retroactively decided it was, you know, the people of Israel. Um, that was one of the hypotheses put forward. Okay, yeah, I, I haven't uh, heard that one where it was like a, a slave hey, rebellion. Again, it. that was only part of it. And that was more the, you know, the Southern in the mountains and you know how multifaceted 
the uh, actual generation yeah. of that people was. So now on that same verse, until I Deborah arose in Hebrew ad shakamti Deborah. The verb kamti is a second personal singular, but Amit notes that according to verses 12, 16, uh, yeah, 12, verses 12 and 16, Deborah is not the speaker. This led the Septuagint to read in the third person, until Deborah rose up. Sasson, however, notes that in recent days, kamti has been translated as second person because there is a fair number of such feminine forms that end in T. Fernandez Marcos writes that MT should be retained and interpreted as second person with an archaic ending. On verse 8, God chose new leaders. Hebrew Bible reads, Yivchar Elohim Chadashim. If read literally, it reads, He, i.e. Israel, will choose new gods. The traditional understanding of this clause, as seen in the Septuagint, Tagum, followed by traditional commentators Butler and Nidich, is they chose new gods. Amit notes that some modern commentators reject this reading since they assert that the religious rebuke is a sign of later editing. She writes, however, that the claim to worship God alone and avoid Canaanite worship is not an innovation of the Deuteronomic literature. In contrast, Smith and Blocksmith write, Literally, literarily, this clause seems to stand alone. It has no clause parallel to it, in contrast to the next three lines, which can be read in parallelism. They also continued the earlier thread with the lack of armed warriors, elaborating on the mention of no village militias. Accordingly, the initial line of verse 8 seems like a later addition made in keeping with the sort of concern expressed in Deuteronomy 32.17. Man Manfred Gerg comments, the, in, sorry, the indiscriminate choice of new gods calls to mind Deuteronomic language, thus betraying an emergent monotheism, end quote. Moreover, the traditional interpretation has been criticized on other grounds, quote, a description of apostasy, they chose new gods, end quote, is out of place in a victory poem that nowhere else mentions it, end quote. They note other suggestions, suggested readings. One uh, offered by Cross, they chose new leaders, reading Elohim as leaders. Sec uh, two by Knauf, the gods' favorite foreigners. And three, God chose new leaders, seeing Elohim as the subject and Hadashim as the direct object. They favor the last interpretation and write that it is, quote, grammatically possible and it ob obviates the problem of positing an exceptional meaning for Elohim, end quote. They also note Hesse's opinion, or observation, that this option fits the context of bat uh, of battler better than the other, sorry, the context of battle better than the other options. Likewise, Nelson and Sasson favor this reading. Now on that same verse, when war came to the city gates, in Hebrew it's as, lach sorry, as lachem she'arim. Early translations vary on the reading of this phrase. Vaticanus has, then the cities of rulers fought, reading Lachamu Sha'are Arim. Alexandrinus and Peshitta read barley bread, reading Lechem Seorim. Voget has, he himself overthrew the gates of the enemies. Most modern commentators read, then war was in the gates, with Nelson writing that war translates an otherwise unattested noun from the root Lamet Chet Mem. And Gates provides an urban poetic contrast to peasantry in verse 7. JPS reads this phrase as a rhetorical question. Was there a fighter then in the Gates? On that same verse, 40,000 in Israel. Sasson comments, 40,000 is an imposing count for people, and it is fairly frequent in the census lists of numbers 1, 2, and 26. Joshua 4.13 has this precise number of equipped troops parading to war before the Lord towards the plains of Jericho. Controlling an imperfect in the Nif'al, Yera'e, the particle im shapes a question with a negative implication. No, never could there be found so many soldiers without defensive shields, magen, or offensive spears, romach, because after all, God is taking over the battle. This couplet is rather straightforward. Nonetheless, it has elicited emendations, none worth documenting. But I might note a curious reading in Alexandrinus, if I saw protection of halberds among 40,000. 
The poet attributes this observation to Deborah or to himself, so setting us into the first person mode that we will meet in the verse following. On verse 10, you who ride on white donkeys. In Hebrew, it's rochvei atunot tzchorot. The word tzachor, in the sense of tawny or white, is a hapax. Alexandrinus has mounted upon draft animals, omitting the atonot. This reading is favored by Fernandez Marcos, who writes that there is evidence that the word atonot in the Masoretic text has been added by a glossator to explain tzchorot. Likewise, Nelson writes that donkeys was added in MT as a gloss to explain tawny ones, an obscure or obsolete usage designating a special color of a donkey. Sasson reads gleaming she asses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, could, I mean, yeah, it would have to be the female ones because, you know, the, some association with royalty. But yes. yeah, the, uh, the idea that the donkey one would be added would, uh, that the, you know, word for donkey there would be added would make sense because especially if you look at kind of how uh kind of the, the way that the i forget what it's called where there's that parallelism between those between like lines so like you would have one description oh riders on like the tawny ones or like so you'd already have like some high uh some indication of a higher class and then it, you know after that you'd have sitting on cloths would be another indication of that same yeah. thing. So they continue to describe the same one. I, I can't really figure out what a gleaming she ass looks like, but I'm kind of wanting to see an illustration. <laughs> Dude, this just go on deviant art. You'll be fine. Ah. <laughs> I was just gonna say cut straight to Pornhub. My ass is fabulous, but it's not <laughs> it's not going to be out gleaming. You don't you don't get enough gleaming on Pornhub. <laughs> There's no <laughs> gleaming on deviant art. I, I have not seriously studied it that much. <laughs> Peter, what happened to our faces on here? Oh, Somebody never mind. Anyway, Mark showed up. Jesus like... part, Mark. Mark? Oh, that would be fantastic. Guys, hey, uh, just a quick quick comment. There he is. Those... Mark, hey. Sorry, I just a quick interruption. There's someone in the live chat, our resident, uh, you know how we always get a rogue believer coming in. This one is sort of uh, appears to be playing at being a pseudo pantheist to set himself up with a superiority complex and a bit of persecution porn. So just guys leave Jacob alone. He if nobody plays with him, he'll have to actually, you know, either he'll think play or with go himself. away. Well, I'm sure he already does that plenty. But Mark, I'm so glad you came. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Uh yeah. we haven't gotten too far, but Oh, yeah, it's okay. I, I apologized at the beginning of the show that you weren't able to join us because I had to reschedule this so many times. Oh, nice. you just, yeah. I, 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 I said was... you'd be showing up in the second hour, so thank you for that. In in all fairness, Arn, the chat did did their best to uh, stretch it out so we would start half an hour later because and that that's what I it took. Thirteen verses in, because you know, song to, and to, to, to my annoyance too, because uh, just as soon as it hits five. For me, I'm gonna have to be out of here. <gasps> oh my god! What time is it where you are now? Four, four oh four. Fuck. Okay, well, let's get let's going. Get people. Yeah. Okay, on verse eleven, the voice of the singers in Hebrew it's kol mechatzim. The meaning of mechatzim is unclear. Some commentators, like BDB Dictionary, Amit, and Butler, derive it from the root chatzatz to divide. Amit explains that this refers to the shepherds who divide the herds when they give them water to drink. Likewise, Fernandez Marcos translates distributors. Smith and Blocksmith render despoilers. And Kara and sorry, Kara and in addition to Rashi wrote that Mechatzetzim refers to pebbles smoothed by a stream, as seen in Lamentations 316. Kimchi, Gersonides, and Abavanel took Mechatzetzim to be a denominative PL from Chetz, arrow, and so read archers. While this reading is attested in the KJV, JPS, and Sasson, Smith and Block, sorry, uh, is attested in KJV, JPS, and Sasson, Smith and Blocksmith wrote that there is little in the context that suggests this proposal. Septuagint has music makers, based on 2 Chronicles 5, 12-13, in Hebrew, Machatzotzerim. Likewise, Nidich reads tambourines, Nelson's musicians. Other suggestions include strategists by Menachem Ibn Saruk, Troops by Ditrani and Chariots by Vulgate. 
Cherry and Fun. Orchid. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a band name. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And, and finally, on verse 13, the remnant of the nobles came down. It hid with Yerad Sarid La Adirim. The exact meaning of this phrase is unclear. Traditional commentators, Nidich and Sasson, derived Yerad from the root Reish Dalet He, to dominate, i.e., the surviving Israelites dominated over the mighty Canaanites. Amit, however, objects to this reading and writes that it is hard to understand why the people of Yahweh are called a remnant even before the battle. Moreover, it is not clear if Adirim, mighty ones, refers to the Israelites or to the Canaanites. Vaticanus has, then a remnant went down for the strong ones, reading Yagad as the verb to come down. Likewise, Peshitta and Tagumbid come down. This reading is favored by Butler, Fernandez Marcos, and Nelson. In Vogue, it reads, the remnants of the people are saved. That's it for my commentary on this part of this chapter. Okay, uh, Lilith, let's pick up reading, please. All Finish right. The what do we say? Please. Uh, I Thank said you. please. Now. You did. Now, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hurry up. Oh, if you think that's the way to get me to do anything. <laughs> oh, you do not have the room. I saw that. Anyway, <laughs> verse 13. Then the men who were left came down to the nobles. The people of the Lord came to me with the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Machir, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear a commander's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak. Rushing after him into the valley in the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the campfires to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coves. The people of Zebulun risked their very lives. So did Naphtali on the heights of the field. Kings came, they fought. The kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh, by the waters of Meg Megiddo. But they carried off no silver, no plunder. From the heavens, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away, the age-old river, the river Kishon. March on, my soul, be strong. Then thundered the horse's hooves, galloping, galloping, go his mighty steeds. Cursed Meroz, said the angel of the Lord, curse its people bitterly, because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed of women be a Jael, the wife of Kiber, the Canaanite. Most blessed of tent-dwelling women. He asks for water, and she gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him curdled milk. Her hand reached for the tent peg, her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera, she crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. At her feet he lay. He fell, there he lay. At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. Through the window peered Sisera's mother. Behind the lattice she cried out, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why is the clatter of his chariots delayed? The wisest of her ladies answered her. Indeed, she keeps saying to herself, Are they not finding and dividing the spoils? A girl or two for each man. Colorful garments as plunder for Sisera, colorful garments embroidered, high embroidered garments for my neck, all this as plunder. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but may they who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. Then the land had peace for 40 years. Then I got a question. And you, should, you guys should be able to guess what it is. From the heavens, the stars fought. Mm. Stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away. 
the age-old river, the River Kishon. The river swept away stars? Yes. Who no. gathered it's, up multiple I, I, stars. I, 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 have, I have comments no. on this, but... No, the, you, could, you could totally read that as the river swept away the men as they were fleeing yes. or as they were crossing, uh, you know, like a flooded river or... Or breaking it, how many stars does it take to beat up one guy? But is it stars? It, okay, first of all, they're fighting an it, army. It, but is it, it stars it physically fighting, or is it like the the portents of the stars have turned against Sisera at the will of Yahweh? Are we talking mm. about just astrology here? Depends on the on the the commentary. I mean, I, the yeah. some of the older traditional ones have literally like this is how we know how big a star is because. The, the 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 star reached from the heavens and was able to fight so it was it's uh as big as the distance from the earth to the firmament and we know from somewhere else that stars are uh as big as the firmament itself so now we know that the firmament the thickness of the firmament firmament is the same as the distance from earth to the firmament like yeah that that but, was a pretty common interpretation yeah in fact they even had that in mesopotamian literature as well where they right. Well, I'm completely thing. misunderstood because I, <laughs> I thought there was a single dome-shaped firmament, but now I realize that I, I just heard Isaac pronounce it as feminine. No, so I, I'm imagining, I, I, I now I'm imagining two domes. I, I, I spelled it. No, no, it's just that they, it's kind of like the actual, like the stars are in the thickness of the, of the, uh, of the, of the, am I saying it wrong? Firmament? Or firm, firmament. 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 Yeah, I think the point is they're Two embedded M's. in the layer. Yeah, the, they, they are inside of it. But uh, did you guys miss Arn's joke? <laughs> yes, they all did. <laughs> oh, no. Sorry. Two, oh, yeah, two domes, you fucking bozos. Ah! <laughs> God! How am I not perverted enough for this show? Yeah, seriously. You <laughs> can ask so about that past in the domes. Yeah. <laughs> Then yeah. Eric Wander says, uh, was Sisera murdered in his sleep? Yes. Judges 421 says, yes, he was fast asleep. Judges 5, 26, and 27 says, no, he was awake and standing up. Any commentary on this? I, I don't think it All right. means yeah. he was awake and standing up. I, I think fell at his feet or fell at her feet is like, you know, he collapsed Obviously, he was already on the ground, but, you know, you find the prostrate body dead. It's kind of a, I think it might be a bit of a turn of phrase. Yeah. No, Besides, it, yeah. the only sense is to let the man go to sleep with the milk and the, you know, and then. Maybe it just refers to him, you know, falling asleep, like, you know, being so weak. Any, any like, good. Were there sexual innuendos in the earlier version of the story? Yes. That you read? Yes, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So he well, he could we, well have been lying in bed and standing up at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> recall what re, recall what sorry. Arn, any Christian apologist will tell you he was sleepwalking and now it makes sense. <laughs> no, so but, he was uh, sleep fucking? I don't... Let, let's not do that one. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, I think that this is a pretty uh you know the whole like uh, he you know falling at someone's feet thing is a is a pretty common phrase for like when someone loses they prostrate themselves and you know, that kind of thing to show that uh you are so much better than i but no he's he's dead though uh <laughs> so i don't think they are necessarily like uh necessarily contradictions there's a little quote here from um about it's from the talmud it says that rabbi, Yo rabbi yochanan said Sisera slept with Yael seven times in that same day. I mentioned that in the previous episode. Okay. There, hey, get, get it, girl. Recall, <laughs> recall the Vidic's comment, the phallic thrust of the tent stake. I want well, you and, all to remember that in mind. I, I remember, I remember that. And it's, it's a power thing, too. Sex is about power. That's why in Troy, uh, the... You know, when the king came in, he he raped Helen to show his dominance over her. It's so, you know, having a woman do the smiting and the penetrating with the phallic thrust is uh, is definitely taking him down a peg in more ways than one. Um, hmm. But I, I love this 
this thing at the end with the Cicero's mother, not his wife, his mother is waiting for him and saying, why is he taking so long? And her maids, the clever ones who want to keep her in a good mood say, oh, he's probably dividing up the spoils, you know, bringing home a few girls for fun and, and, you know, maybe some pretty, pretty garments for you. And it, but it also sort of the idea of her waiting and, and him never coming, it gives a little bit of the, um, hearing the lamentations of the women flavor. Well, it's actually, it's actually worse. The word that is used to describe the girl here is racham, which usually take, is taken to mean womb. Yeah, literally means mean a, a oh, womb or two. A womb or two, of course. Some beauties. Um, I was going to say, isn't the whole reference to the feet, um, isn't it so also a euphemism for sex as well? It is, also, it is always a euphemism. Always. Everything is a euphemism yes. for sex. Yeah. Very good. In the right state of mind, everything can be, yes. <laughs> According to um, a biblical literalist, is this the only example of something fictional in the Bible? I, even even literalists can't be so literal minded that you can't allow an occasional turn of phrase like falling at their feet. No, no, but, the, the, the bit about the um, Cicero's mother and, and her servant. Oh, uh, obviously, well, Deborah didn't it's know. It's within the context of a song, so it, it very clearly mm. has the excuse of narrative. Yeah. Uh, thrust without necessarily prophet, being a literal. <laughs> hmm? Maybe she's a prophet, so she knew. Oh, of course. I, I'm sorry. You're right. She she had a vision of Cicero's mother and decided to gloat in a song about it because reasons. <laughs> oh, and and by the way, That's I said much more probable uh, than a woman telling a story. I said previously that the uh, the reference to the 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 river is like the stars by itself. I I forgot that it's not the case. Uh, so I'll I'll come back to that when I'll uh, reach the commentary. So I'll start in verse uh, fourteen. Some came from Ephraim whose roots were in Amalek. Tagum reads from those of the house of Ephraim there arose Joshua the son of Nun, son in, with a U. Uh, <laughs> he first waged battle against those of the house of Amalek. And I, th- I think it's a song with you. Uh, this reading is supported by traditional commentators. Uh, I need to check the toggle as, as well. I wonder, if Nelson, there's a, is there sorry. a relationship between Amalek and Amalekia? Oh, my God, Aaron. Uh, no, it's... it's <laughs> For those of you not, uh, not not involved, it, Amalekia is a character from uh, from the, the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> No, it's oh, the sun. Okay, it's a sun with an with an O, not a U. Sorry, I I misread that. Of course. Um, okay. I imagine Amalekia is, but comes from like the the root for that means king, and Amalek is 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 spelt slightly different. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll continue. This reading by the Tagum is supported by traditional commentators. Nelson writes that the roots presumably means that Ephraim was thought to have originated from some sort of association with the Amalekites and might have originated as a defamatory anti-Ephraimite slur. Butler sees roots as homeland and writes that if the text of 1215 is correct, then the Amalekites possessed part of Ephraim's territory. In that case, verse 14 builds off such Amalekite occupation, quote-unquote, to commend Ephraim for, for for participation, even when their own homeland, the roots, quote unquote, stood under foreign dominion. Smith and Blocksmith write that Amalek is viewed here and in 1215 neutrally. Uh, yeah, neutrally. In contrast to the negative reputation it has it has throughout the Bible. They write that the neutral references in Judges, quote, lend credence to these representations as early, prior to the historical co- conflict between Amalek and Israel, end quote. The root in Amalek suggests possible kingship relations, as seen in Isaiah 11.10 and 14.29. They add, quote, It seems that in verse 14, Ephraim is characterized in terms of an early constructive connection with Amalek, end quote. And Alexander reads, People of Ephraim wreaked vengeance on them. I mean, I think this, uh, like everything that we're reading now, uh, since, uh, since, first of all, we get you know, some very 
clear references to the story that we had in Judges 4, then now we have like an actual solid like, you know, I like this part either you know, either it could have been like added it was certainly added later to the song, but uh, you know, as to whether or not did it come at the same time as the inclusion of the Cicera story or uh, did it come later? I don't know. But uh, there are certainly a lot of very early, very early stylistic motifs in here. So like the stars fighting is, is one of them, for example, that pops up in Ugaritic literature and in, uh, in Babylonian literature, Assyrian lit, like that, that that's everywhere where the stars can come down and fight. Usually it's portrayed as a bad thing, but here it's of course positive because, uh, you know, they kind of have uh, God sending them out to do that. Against the I, was, I was wondering about the, uh, I was wondering about the, the tribes mentioned, like, it seems almost like a different list of tribes, like tribes we know missing some of the ones, some of them, but then there's it like, it seems like an older other, list, I would maybe. guess. Um, Is it possible that these, yeah. Because they're they're calling out uh, both pro and con, you know, Ephraim. Some leaders came from Ephraim. Zebulun came in, you know. Issachar was badass, running into the valley with Barak, you know. And then you get into um, why didn't you come, Reuben? What what was wrong with Gilead and Dan? Why did you linger? Why were you hesitant to come and and support the cause? So. I, I honestly think that plays into the, you know, the stuff that where they talked about it, either a change of leadership or a change of gods, where at least from Deborah's perspective, certain of the Israelite leaders are not stepping up to do what they're supposed to do and show up for this battle and, and you know, bring it to, to Sisera. Mm. And, and some are, and she praises those who showed up and blames those who didn't. But, yeah, but they, me, are these are the tribes that are listed? Are they all northern tribes? Um, um I mean, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, on the later, well, races, except for Ruben. Yes, but yeah, but was Issachar really all that north? See, I don't kind remember. of a big one in the middle, no. Well, the thing is, I'm I'm thinking about the division between Israel and Judah, right? Oh, well, in that case, then yeah. Aside from maybe Reuben, which but but it would have still been no, it would have still been. Yeah, if you're talking about the later division, this is all northern tribes. So there's no Benjamites, there's no Levites, there's no um, Simeonites. Judah's not mentioned. Or Judah. And then you've got, but it also it mentions Gilead, as if, I mean, yeah. maybe it's just a city, but maybe that was, maybe Gilead was a tribe. Or well, maybe tribes were cities. Like, you know, Dan is the name of a city and a and tribe. Yeah. Or you could have like, a, maybe like an Amphictony style thing where it's mm -hmm. like, uh, uh leagues of cities that constitute mm. tribes yes yeah, so it could be that who was considered the tribes of israel could have, may have changed over time and this yeah. reflects a really I, I, early sure. idea I think that's very likely i, I have a no here yeah i have a comment by nelson who writes to be mentioned together the 10 tribes of verses 40 to 18 must have had some historical connection or attributes in common the active tribes were more central geographically than the more marginal reuben gilead dan and Asher. Evoking sea and ships underscores the peripheral nature of the latter two. Also, yeah, mentioning so, so ships this, with, this... with uh, the wrong one as well. So if this snuck in around the time of the Assyrian invasion, that would make sense. Where the people of Israel were moving to, to Judah. Hmm. Yeah, I could see that. There's a lot of a lot of stuff that is that is affected by that. And you wonder if like if some of it was brought, some of it was more adapted to, you know, the pro Judahite, um, Judah, Benjamin, Southern Kingdom vibe, but this one wasn't. And, you know, it, it makes no mention of the Southern tribe specifically and, and has no bent towards that. And I, I sort of wonder, I wonder at that. And then yet again, I don't because, you know, she's a female judge. So we can totally say that the Northern tribes failed and that's why they had a female judge. Yeah. I was just thinking like if Gilead was a tribe, then the whole story of like, you know, well, where was it? The story with uh, Gilead and like 
them sending over messages and then and becoming ending up being uh you know water carriers and whatnot that seems if they were originally one of the tribes then mm. that could reflect some something that happened yeah like, something perhaps where they were considered to have betrayed the others ended up in as slaves some way. yeah and then and then a later story explaining what oh they're actually you know canaanites and right blah, blah, blah. and they mm. tricked us so we couldn't kill them boohoo hmm. now Possibly. on that same verse on on that same verse verse 14 from zebulun those who bear a commander's staff hebrew for commander's staff is shevet sofer the word sofer is generally taken to mean muster officer as seen in second kings 25 19 and bdb dictionary kimchi and kara took it to mean the wise men alexandrinus has the scepter of him who prevails in leadership vaticanus those who draw with a rod of a scribe's account and Vulgate, out of Zebulun, they that led the army to fight. Smith and Blocksmith write that if commander or officer is the correct reading, then this line would praise Zebulun for its leadership, a point that also comports with the reference to this tribe in verse 18. On verse, so verses 15b through 16, Nelson comments, Verses 15b through 16 may be an inherited unit, a taunt song based on traditional tribal aphorisms, with purported underperformance performance highlighted by accusatory why questions. Some see the presence of Reuben as an indication of a period before the 9th century Mesha inscription, which indicates that by the time Reuben's territory had been conquered by God. By that time, Reuben's territory has been conquered by God. On verse 17, Gilead state beyond the Jordan. Gilead does not designate a tribe, but a region. One Septuagint manuscript and the Peshitta read Gad instead of Gilead. And according to Sasson, the general assumption is that Gilead is a substitution of Gad. Kara writes that Gilead is the half-tribe of Manasseh, with Kimchi and Abavanel noting that Gilead was the son of Machil. According to Numbers 26, 29, 27, 1, 36, 1, and 1 Chronicles 2, verses 21 to 23. Smith and Blocksmith wrote that Gilead as both a region and a tribe, Ugaritic Gat Gelad in KTU 41252, and Akkadian Ga La Ada in Dulat 294. Um, Gilead is both a region and a tribe. Fernandez Marcos, however, writes that it is clear from numerous references that Gilead is a geographical name. On Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Hebrew for linger by the ships is yagu oniyot. Amit writes that the verb yagu is derived either from the root yud gimel reish, to fear, or from gimel vav reish, to dwell or live in. Most commentators read dwell, although Kimchi wrote that it is a bit puzzling since Dan did not live next to the seashore. He writes that this refers to the ships of the Jordan River. Amit, who wrote that Lama, why, is a term of negation, understood the phrase to mean Dan did not linger by the ships. Butler writes that the song places Dan in its earliest coastal location and views the people of Dan as landless resident aliens working for the local shipping industry. And the Vogat and Targum omit the why. On verse 18, Nelson notes that Zebulun and Naphtali, being the only tribes who fought in chapter 4, come in for a special highlighted comment. In contrast, it contrasts them with the indecisiveness of the previous verses and transitions into the battle action, in which Israel will not be a part of. He writes that the verse, quote, indicates that these two tribes were central to Israel's military response. On verse 19, Ta'anach. Yeah, Ta'anach. Smith and Blocksmith write that Ta'anach is generally identified at Tel Ti'inik. 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 Yeah. And archaeological excavations there revealed late Bronze Age occupation that perhaps ended in destruction, followed by sparse resettlement in the first Iron Age. They note that the destruction of Ta'anach has been attributed to Faro Sheshong I, Shishak in the, in the Bible. 
based on Pharaoh's claimed conquest of Tanakh in a campaign during Rehoboam's reign in 1 Kings 14.25, which is generally dated between 930s and 925 BCE. Also also something we can confirm historically, by the way. Yeah, yeah. The Pharaoh Shoshank was... uh... Yeah. They write that despite its repeated destructions, the poem celebrates on a conquest of the Ta'anach. They further write, the text might presume an Israelite population at Ta'anach to be defeated and despoiled by the Canaanites. Neither biblical texts nor archaeology unambiguously identifies the Ta'anach population as Israelite. According to Joshua 12.21, Israel defeated Ta'anach, which is not specified in the preceding conquest narrative. But Joshua 17 verses 11 to 13 and Judges 127 acknowledge Canaanites still reside resident in the town. Pottery of this period offers no help. It retains Canaanite features of the late Bronze Age, but also incorporates characteristics that will dominate Israelite quote unquote pottery of later centuries. Not until the reign of Solomon does Ta'anach appear among Israelite holdings, 1 Kings 4.11. The archaeological evidence, however, suggests that the listing of administrative districts in 1 Kings 4 may reflect the reality of the Omride period, roughly 50 years later. Yeah, you know what? Omride makes, uh, makes sense, too. Now on verse 20, their courses. And I like Rashi's comment here. The upper tip of the star was in heaven, the bottom on the earth. This teaches that the width of the firmament is equivalent to the distance between heaven and earth. For the star is suspended across the firmament like a sort of bolt across a door, its length measuring the same as the width of the firmament. From this passage, which attests that they waged war in their pathways, we learn that the width of the firmament is the same as the elevation of heaven from earth. And does that not also again describe a dome? I mean, when it comes to the width, if the height of it is the same as the width, okay, no, could be and a it's cube. going around a disc. Mm. The height of it is the same as the width, or the height of it is the same as the uh, the, di- the 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 like the, the width, width of, of the... the firmament is the same as the elevation of heaven from earth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that one, like the thickness, either is way, the same as the height. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that that doesn't t- uh, tell us about the the shape thing. Wait, that that's still like the one, the one. Uh, what's it called? The one wrench I gotta I gotta deal with. I mean, like, I think dome just, just, just makes sense. I think what? dome just makes sense because of the way it looks. Like oh, um... totally, to- it makes sense. But do we have the do we have the Written. textual evidence to support it? Right. I know the the word vault is used, but I don't know if that's that's an English word that's translated right. from. Because yeah. we have we it's it's the understanding of what the uh, what of what uh, rakia is, right? So like oh, okay, yeah, that, yeah. that's right, kind yeah. of like you know, kind of tracking it back Expanse. into Mesopotamian uh, stuff, which is yeah, which is why I, mean, I said like a a yeah. better diachronic evaluation needs to be done. Does it say anywhere something about the blue mountains holding the sky, or is that not? That's Bible. that's definitely in uh, in Mesopotamian texts, um, oh. but again, that could be interpreted in a, in a couple <laughs> ways too. Uh, and yeah, I just thought that pillows. was in the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> what what yeah. about the root of the word? The root of the word, I, if we're firmament, isn't it like something related to metallurgy or some kind of? Yeah, like being like hammered out. Uh huh. Like yeah. how you would make a some sort of bowl or something. Or I mean, like it, it could be a whole play. bunch of other things, like a shield. Uh, like, mm. like the the thing is, yeah, the word can apply to to many to many things. But a shield would still be curved somewhat for. I mean, there are different purposes. ways to make a shield. If it's hammered out, then yeah, it would be curved. Yeah. I mean, I think a dome also it makes not only does it make sense like from our perspective, I think it would makes more sense to an ancient perspective because they wouldn't have known as much about perspective. Right. And they I wouldn't have agree. understood that if you had a flat surface, it would look like. A, I, I I totally get it, but mm. still I'm looking for like hints of the only the only option we we know that the dome is going to be like the strongest structure, and the only thing that's contradicting that is when Chicken Little saw the sky fall down. 
you know what? Maybe Chicken Little got a hold of some bad shrooms. You know, Ma- uh, Mark, uh, Mark has, uh, has uh, read this uh, book as well. So in um, Mesopotamian Cosmic Geography, right, uh, Horowitz points out that, like, one of the very common myths was that uh, you would have the firmament attached, or the sky, what, which, however way you want to put it, attached to the earth by, by ropes or cords. Uh, so, like, if one is, like, hanging from the other, uh, then you could either have it be, like, a dome or just, like, hanging straight down, which is still the part that I'm looking for, like, an, ex- an explicit thing of. Uh, I, th- I think while, you might have... It, ep- it does make sense. You're absolutely right. It does make sense to, like, in that ancient perspective, to view it as a dome, uh, and there is some uh, evidence in Mesopotamian texts to support that. I am still wondering about, like, th- this is where the diachronic issue needs to be solved. Like, at some point in time, did it change from one uh, cosmology to another? And in what mm. places? And uh, so, like, that that's the important part that I still really want to to get at. And yeah. I don't know if I could totally solve that in the in the video, but I think that that is probably the most yeah. crucial uh, I mean, if you look at Genesis, in Genesis it, it talks about the sep- the, firm- the firmament separating the waters above from the waters below, yes. which that kind of feels more flat. No, no, you, you wouldn't be able to support the weight of water unless it's a dome shape because of the strength. Well, yeah, but the then is, when then the waters connect, it's totally different, right? Stop so, bringing reality into mythology. What if we play a little bit with like the like the Mesopotamian? View. So, like, uh, well, one of them, right? Uh, so, Marduk takes his sword and he splits Tiamat in half. And it's one, like, one half of her carcass is the, you know, the body, you know, the, the floor, you know, the crust of the earth or whatever, the, you know, the ground. And then the other half of her body, which if you, if you imagine a rib cage, like from the inside, it, it could be dome mm-hmm. shape look i totally get it i'm not just to, just to be very clear here i'm not ruling it out that's not that's not yeah. my thing that's not what i'm saying i'm not you're saying trying yeah, to make sure that yeah. you're not reading not. your desired end into yes. the text yes i get it i get right. it you're you're being i think perhaps a little unduly but admirably uh rigorous in your I, I, i'm sorry to me jeff this awesome. whole discussion came from rashi's comment <laughs> on Judges 520, which doesn't mention the firmament. That's why Rashi is the greatest commentator. Exactly. Now, <laughs> I'll, I'll what continue. about the bowl with right. curdled He's milk? He's more original than origin. Uh, I, I haven't finished the comment on verse 20. So. Okay, go for it. Go on. Okay, so Kara wrote that this shouldn't be taken literally, since nobody saw the stars coming down from the firmament to the earth. Instead, God sent his messengers from the place where the stars go out of their course, and they fought with God. Kimchi writes that their victory against Sisera was so great as if the heavens fought against Sisera. He also notes that according to Talmud Pesachim 118b, the stars heated their ironware, and they went to the Kishon River to cool down, and the river swept them away. Nelson notes that stars forming in an army sorry that stars forming an army of heaven and being led by Yahweh is attested in other passages such as Isaiah 40:26 and Jeremiah 33:22. Stars also can also be symbolic of royal and noble power such as the star from Jacob in Numbers 21:7. He also suggested that the stars function in an astrological sense de- deviating from their standard orbits in order to favor Israel. Nidich describes the stars as Yahweh's foot soldiers. Sasson writes that divine intervention during battles is a well-known theme in the ancient Near East, with, its, with this particular imagery also occurring in an Akkadian text in which Sargon of Akkad enters a mythical land where nature treats him as an enemy, and, quote, the stars sailed forth against the enemy, end quote. And Butler comments, Lindas discusses various theories about the stars, favoring the traditional image, boosted by Ugaritic evidence, that the stars poured the rain down. He rejects any suggestion that they represent Deborah's army, with Deborah taking the position traditionally occupied by the goddess Anat in mythological texts. Lindas also denies any connection to the eclipse of the sun in 1131 BCE. 
Block sees the use of the forces of nature as a sign that Yahweh, quote, usurps the signs of theophan theophanic advent which Canaanites had associated with Baal. On like verse 20. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, I just. One other possible interpretation of stars. Yeah, they could have been attacked by Charlton Heston and Aubrey Hepburn. <laughs> Oh, I'd be more scared of Catherine Hepburn. That woman is gonna <laughs> kick your arse. But uh, I mean, isn't isn't there a not mythology? Isn't there like an opinion that stars are literally angels? Like yeah, I was just, just well, yeah, it's, of angel. it's, it's the it's the host of heaven, is what it is. The, host the thing of is, heaven... it's an it's an army. Is, is no, what no, it... no. I don't mean that. Like that, that when you see the word stars attacking, it means the host of heaven. I mean that stars that we see. Are literally, are literally angels, angels. that yeah. are massive and you know flaming and give us outfits. light. Yeah, yeah. I've absolutely heard that, and there is some. Um, I think there's some overlap between what's being described here and that. Potentially, if you think of uh, when Elisha was um, eh, when he was in the city that was being surrounded or being uh, it was under siege, and his servant said. Oh, what are we going to do? And he's like, what? We have more power than them. And he prays for God to open the eyes of his servants. And then he says, oh, the chariots and horses of Israel. And he sees, you know, all around this great army that's encircling him are these divine warriors and chariots and horses. And, and basically, uh, if you ever watch uh, a bit of uh, Jehovah's Witness propaganda where they have the glowing men in dresses on swords, or with swords on horseback flying through the air, kind of like that. That's the vibe you're getting. So they're invisible unless your eyes have been opened by the spirit of God, but they can still, you know, slaughter people indiscriminately uh, and totes for real these guys, promise. Although there it wouldn't have been the stars, uh, but it would have mm -hmm. certainly been, you know, God's army. The host of heaven kind of- it Could I, have been I, a development, like, you know, these are the gods giving us light and then they became angels and then they became... yeah th that's a later story oh, I wasn't mean... it also too that it could have been referring to planets even though they called them stars because they all they thought yeah, that they were true. wondering stars were these them, planets yeah yeah planets are just uh the web yeah the web planet is just re didn't refer to earth at all and it did refer yeah. to the moon and the sun Okay. Yeah, they, they thought the yeah. planets were stars, but they didn't think that the sun was a star. <laughs> this is this is one of my big problems with you know the the idea mm. that, the, that this book was written by God. I'm thinking that God would probably have corrected misunderstandings, even if even if it was a bit advanced. I'm thinking somewhere in there, if this book was written by God. There would have been some kind of concept that, hey, oh, by the way, I know that everything that the book says so far implies that the earth is flat. It's not actually flat. I know that I said myself in Job that the earth takes the shape of, of clay under a seal, and that would give you the impression that it's disc-shaped. But no, it's it's actually a sphere. You know, it, it, and then and then I would have put it out. You know that that the, the sun is actually a star. It's just really close, and all the other stars are really far away. I would put stuff like that in there. Uh, you see, you you have um, well, you're you've not considered a couple of things. One, you clearly actually care about educating people, and there's no indication whatsoever that God ever gave a single tinker's damn about that. And second <laughs> of all, even a half decent God might have been like. You know, these people are killing their kids to stave off uh, an incoming army because they think that's going to fucking help. Maybe uh, maybe we'll get to the science lessons later. Of course, he didn't. He just made them worse. Mm -hmm. But, you know. Eh. Yeah, you can't exactly use the same excuse they use for why God couldn't tell them not to keep slaves. Yeah, no, yeah. not at all. No, God is still a massive cunt waffle. And he's not the only one. So is Florida Governor DeSantis, Ugh. who uh, who just signed a bill that says that Satanists cannot be chaplains in Florida. Mm, that's illegal. Yeah. Yeah. Because he decided it's, it's Satanism is not a religion. So now we have where the government's going to have to come down with a definition of what a religion is. Uh, <laughs> they're gonna oh. fail 
Good luck, government. You're gonna <laughs> suck at this. That's, You're gonna fuck that's everything. Gonna... If the government even attempts that, they're gonna fuck up so many things. That's definitely not gonna <laughs> backfire on him. <laughs> yeah, from a what, government. I mean, it's kind of like all those book bands, and then people were like, what, why are you letting this be in our children's schools? Do you know how many rapey, incest, genocides are in here? No. Get it out of my third grader's classroom. Yeah. What what has Ron DeSantis ever done that hasn't backfired? Hey, you know what I should do on my presidential I, I, campaign? I, I'm sorry, Your I'm interjecting. go go boots. I'm sorry that I'm interjecting. Ron DeSantis <laughs> is not in the Bible. You've talked for five minutes on unrelated <laughs> subjects, and then you complain <laughs> that we're not done with this chapter. So, <laughs> and Lawrence please. has to go soon. I yes, so exactly. Like Tell him, yes, Tomer. Valid point. Get him, Tomer. Valid point. <laughs> I already got him. So on verse 21, the age-old river. In Hebrew, it's Nachal Ktumim. The word Ktumim has been derived from Kedem, which means ancient, and thus referring to the ancient river, as seen in Vaticanus, Tagums, followed by Kimchi, Nidich, and Nelson. Others took Kedumim to be the river's name, according to Alexandrinus, Vogate, followed by Kara, and, Pesh and the Peshitta reads Karmin, Amit, following Bernie, wrote that the word is corrupt and should be read uh, Kidemam, it forestalled them, i.e. the Kishon River forestalled the Israelites and went up towards them to flood them, as was done, in, as was done to Egypt. Likewise, Smith and Blocksmith read the river surged. Sasson, however, rejects this reading. Wait, the Israelites or the enemies? Uh, the forestalls the... Israelites. Um, I think. Oh, what? Yeah. Are we talking about Let... the enemies of the Israelites or the enemies of Sisera, who are the Israelites and also maybe God and angels and magic? Because yeah, like the verse before is like the the stars fought against Sisera, and then the next one, but is. Yeah, I mean, let me let me check yeah, on this. Uh, see, I, I'll see if this is an, an error on my part, or maybe it's. Uh, uh, I'm, yeah. yeah. While you're so... doing that, I'm going to read a couple of comments. Trevor and Wright says, when referring to the tribes and judges, is it safe to assume that there is any consistency in how these tribes are viewed in the cultural context of being Canaanites in those times? Uh, at the point of time that this is being written or even compiled, uh, they they would have already made that, disso that dissociation. They would have been like, oh yeah, we're our own thing. Okay. And then uh, Mubarak. How do you do, Mubarak? Good to see you again. Offers $4.99. and says, we all know it's a disc on top of four elephants on top of the great Atun. <laughs> <laughs> Even Terry yeah. Pratchett was like, the Thurman is a stupid idea. Uh, I and, and, he, and he has lazy sunlight. Yeah, yeah uh, that, that, that was a mistake on my part. all the way down and tits all the way up. Oh, it was a mistake. Okay. No. Yeah, it was a mistake. I don't. I don't know why. I think because I, I worked on Judges five too much. Like I think I worked like three <laughs> weeks or something. I think Judges nine is uh, like a month. One Judges nine or eleven is like a month of work. So yeah, uh, and I didn't check it today. So um, now I'll continue with twenty three Meroz. Rashi, based on Moed Katan 16a, writes that either Meroz was a star or that it was a distinguished person who was near the battlefield but failed to appear. <laughs> Most traditional commentators, however, saw it as a town which was close to the battlefield. Amit, Butler, and Nidich wrote that we know nothing about Meroz. Sasson writes that Meroz was a place, since we are told about its inhabitants, and although there were some suggestions that it may have been a clan, it may not have formed part of Israel. Smith and Blocksmith note that Moshe Kuchavi identified Meroz with Mazo uh, Chirbet Mazar, about 13 kilometers from Ta'anach. They write, however, that, quote, the lack of knowledge about Meroz might be suggestive, suggestive of its relative antiquity, end quote. on the angel of the Lord in Hebrew, Malach Yehovah. While this could refer to an angel, according to Ditrani, Abravanel, and Nelson and Butler, some interpret Malach as referring to a person, either Barak by Targum, Rashi, and Kara, or Deborah by Kimchi. 
Sasson notes that some schol- scholars wish to remove Malach and attribute the curse to God himself, since most other references to divine curses emanate it directly from God, and because the speech seems un- unmediated. He writes, however, that in poetry, neat transitions are hardly necessary, and assigning the speech directly to God might turn awkward subsequent references to the aid of the Lord. On yeah. verse 26, on verse 26, the workman's hammer, in Hebrew, halmut amalim. The word halmut is a hapax. Most commentators take halmut to be the hammer and amalim be the workers. Amelim be the workers. Rashi, however, took halmut as a verb from the root hey lamedmem, to smite, with amelim referring to Sisera, who was exhausted, amal. Thus, and thus, in her right hand, she smote the exhausted. And Targum reads, to shatter wicked men and oppressors. On verse 27, at her feet he sank. Some commentators took the feet to be a euphemism for the genitals. Nidich notes other passages such as Deuteronomy 28, 57, Judges 3, 24, and 1 Samuel 24, 3, where feet is used to describe genitals and writes that, quote, the enemy lies at her feet, but is also between her legs. <laughs> Mm. Nelson, <laughs> that's an image for you. Nelson writes that while sexuality is not an explicit fact of the narrative, it is plausible. It is a plausible interpretation promoted by rhetoric and poetics. Amit, however, writes that the author of the story keeps an adequate description of the event. Likewise, Nelson, uh, sorry, Sasson writes that such interpretations are far fetched. Quote, not just because poetry does not demand so tribal a connective, but also because their positions, he standing, she about to crush his skull, would make for a gymnastic coupling. Now, on verse 28, the window, Smith and Blocksmith comment, other biblical contexts representing women looking through windows offer some clues about the depiction of this in this verse. Ahab lets the men down through her window in the city wall, according to Joshua 2.15, suggestive of a second story. Two other royal biblical women look down through a window and wait for a victorious hero. In 2 Samuel 6.16, Michal looks out through the window as David dances before the ark. And in 2 Kings 9.30, Jezebel looks out through the window as Yahu enters the scene. By contrast to Michal or Jezebel, Sisera's mother looks for a hero who will never appear. Windows feature in the, the residences of kings, uh, seen in Abimelech in Genesis 26, 8, and other elite figures like David in 2 Samuel 6, 16, and 1 Samuel 19, 12, and Elisha in 2 Kings 13, 17. Goddesses likewise have a window where they look out, quote, at the window of the house sits wise Ishtal, end quote, according to C-A-D-A slash 2, 199. In some, the house of Sisera's mother is imagined as an elite residence with a second-story window, perhaps uh, latticed, affording a view of the expect- expected approach of her heroic son returning from battle. Yeah, help me out with, with, with something you just said that I might have misheard. Outside the window sits what? Because it sounded like you said Ishtar. Yeah, outside, uh, at the window of the house, house sits wise Ishtar. Okay. That's from... Yeah, that's from inscription. Uh, I I didn't find the what exactly it was. I just noted the C A D uh type, the, okay. the index. Now on Sisera's mother, Nidich, based on Susan Ackerman, writes that the mother's aristocratic pose, quote unquote, is quote the conventionalized portrait of the queen mother or woman of status. End quote. She writes that this motif, quote, serves again to emphasize a contrast between the mighty and the weak, the urban and the rural, Canaanite and Israelite, a theme that recurs in the Book of Judges, end quote. And Nelson comments, Sisera's mother and Deborah present contrasting images of motherhood. Deborah as national mother provides military leadership and sings the victory song. Sisera's mother instead speaks out of greed and patriarchy. She longs for booty and tacitly of proofs of battlefield rape and plunder give me that list again she longs for booty and tacitly approves of battlefield rape and plunder okay i just want to make sure i heard all of that correct yes yep it's a bad thing when the canaanites do it on the other hand when yahweh does it it's just the pinnacle of morality 
in in all fairness, Arn, you don't watch Kent Hovind anymore, right? Because he he, he recently no. <laughs> he recently I think he came out uh, saying that that Yahweh is a female. He he did an entire show on the title was God's Amazing Beaver. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe I mistook that. <laughs> okay, my final there comment on weed in the world. My final comment on th verse thirty: a woman or two in Hebrew, racham rachmatayim. The word racham is generally taken to mean womb, according to BDB Dictionary, Nidich, Nelson, and Sasson, and is used to describe either a maiden by traditional commentators or a slave girl by Smith and Blocksmith. Sasson notes that in West Semitic, rechem or ham can describe the goddess Anat as well as a slave woman, as seen in the Mesha inscription. He writes that, quote, in our context, the allusion is to captive women forced to breed slaves for their masters, end quote and thus translates a breeder or two, even worse. Nelson writes that the rhetoric of verse 30 is meant to despise Sisera and the culture he represents. Early translations avoid the reading of woman or womb. For example, Alexandrinus has showing friendship to friends. <laughs> yeah. Vaticanus has being compassionate, he will show compassion. Tagum, giving as spoil a man and his household to each and every one. The Peshitta has gives a mule to each man. The closest reading is found in the Vulgate. The fairest of the women is chosen out for him. And that's it. All right. Um, and, there's uh, also something here about um, that the soldiers take women's clothing for themselves as, as a sort of rhetoric. But I think that's the like a, a later idea. Yeah. Just the pretty bits, you know, to give to their mothers who sit at home. There is at least, uh, you know, Deborah is active, whereas this woman is clearly, you know, sitting cosseted in her in her segregated harem palace. Yeah. Now, I know Lawrence said that this was going to be time for him to go in the last three minutes before he has to dance out of here. Lawrence, what is your impression of how we're going to get through this this next chapter without you? Oh, you guys are still going? I I don't know. That's that's kind of your determination. Oh, uh, oh, wait. Actually, hold on. Next chapter we're starting. It's the Gideon story starting, right? Yeah, Gideon yes. is the good shit. Yeah, hell no. I don't want to fucking miss that. No shot. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> that, that's just too cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all, right, all the stories are wild. So I, I I assume Lawrence wants to be in yeah. every story. Gideon has a know. lot of crazy shit, more than you I just, think. I just. I wanted to clarify because he said I have to leave and it wasn't explicitly clear that we should stop there. So I just wanted that, that clarification. Sure. Yeah. No, the thing is the whole Gideon thing is going to need more, uh, more focus anyways. I'm actually but... excited to hear what you know about Gideon. Because, okay. Gideon's uh... going to be a fun time. Yeah. <laughs> it will be. Well, I know he, I know he put a whole lot of Bibles in people's hotel rooms. Uh, <laughs> uh, right, I got a. Uh, I have a meeting with a professor coming up, uh, right. so uh, I will. Uh, uh, nachos. Yeah, I'll see you guys later. Uh, join the Discord. Uh, subscribe to Milwaukee Atheist. If you're not, you're uh, you, you fucking suck. So go ahead and do that. I'll see you guys. <laughs> okay. All right, and we, we and the rest of us we will meet again on Saturday. Yes. yes. Normal As time? Usual. Very good. Very good. Unless Arin has another SNCC convention or appreciation day or whatever his next excuse will be. <laughs> I, I I suffer from withdrawal symptoms all this week. No. Oh. Don't do this to us, Arin. I feel I feel for you. Okay. See you Saturday. Bye everybody. Leaders. Leaders.